and welcome to part two of our Space Explorers episode with Ryan McDonald, who is... Uh, Ryan, why don't you introduce yourself again, just so I get this completely correct. <laughs> I'm a theoretical astrophysicist working at the University of Cambridge, trying to understand what the atmospheres of exoplanets are made of. Awesome. Wow, that makes what we do seem really dumb, Sam. Oh, Cam, what we do is really dumb. Oh, that's true. <laughs> yeah. That's true. Well, don't worry, because we're yeah. here to learn and find out more. And we've actually brought questions from far cleverer people than we are. Yes. You guys. Yes, so, especially uh, you guys. So, Ryan, get ready for some really grilling questions. Oh, I'm in looking fact, forward to it. These are the ones, yes. The first comes from Mr. Kaz Horrid. Mm -hmm. Said, what does Kaz ask? All right, Kaz wants to know, do films that feature Mars colonization help glamorize the concept and help build support, or do they set unrealistic expectations and unlikely goals? Brackets, are they a help or a hindrance? Oh, that's a great question to start with. Mm. So I would say that overall, the more films that we have about actually sending people to Mars and going to live on Mars, mm -hmm. overall that helps to build an image in our mind that, hey, this is something that's possible. We could mm -hmm. actually do this one day. And in particular, young people grew up wanting to go to Mars in the future. I would say that although many of the early films about Mars colonization were mm -hmm. quite inaccurate, more recent pieces like The Martian, for instance, and the... Um, National Geographic Channel's Mars series mm -hmm. have really put a lot of emphasis into getting the science right. Of course, not perfect by any any means. I'm just I'm just picturing the the, the films when you were saying films in the past. Are you talking about Total Recall? <laughs> <laughs> Terraforming Mars would take a little bit longer than just a few seconds. <laughs> so so yes, the answer is yes. But uh, no, it, I mean it's good to know that that it. In general, it, it does kind of like hook you guys up a little bit. Yeah, and general, sort of justify. definitely, I'd say it's a help. Nice. Cam. Is that is that kind of the swaying of public opinion, basically? Is that where it's helpful? I mean, if the public believes that it's possible, then that's the point where politicians start listening and then space agencies get interested. Mm -hmm. But fortunately now we have private initiatives also trying to do it. Uh -huh. So we will go to Mars. I think we're going to be getting to some questions about <clears throat> said private organisations as well. Indeed, but also, and this is kind of tied into that initial question, and this comes from Mark Scott, and he says, or asks... Just how feasible is it that we could grow potatoes on Mars like Matt Damon? Now, Matt Damon oh. didn't actually grow them on Mars. But the Mark yeah. Watney question. Yes. Mark. Well, the Mark Watney so, question. Yeah. There, there have actually been some experiments that have been going on at the University of Wageningen in the Netherlands recently looking at trying to grow different crop species in a Martian soil simulant. Okay. Um, unfortunately, the early results are that potatoes are one of the worst crops in terms of growing. <laughs> oh, they didn't oh, grow dear. very well. Oh, Mark um, Watley, I'm so sorry. Obviously, they would be the worst. But what if Matt Damon did it? Yeah. Like, maybe he's got se secret potato Well, powers. the funny thing is the research you're doing it actually looks a lot like Matt Damon. No way. There you go. Um... So potatoes, <laughs> although they may be really good from a calorie standpoint, yeah. mm. much more research still has to go into actually establishing if we could grow them. Mm -hmm. And there's other problems to consider, such as there are compounds called perchlorates in the um, top layer soil on Mars, for mm -hmm. instance, that we'd have to find some ways to actually wash out of the soil before using it, for instance. Uh, or, or so you can, you can just place. like mix it with earth soil like he did and... You know, oh, so you say earth things. soil. <laughs> Literal yeah. soil. I suppose soil it's, is the it's correct earth soil. Term. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Earth, I mean, butt earth. stuff. No, no, no. I mean, like, because what he does is he mixes these, like, He tries to seed so it with microbes. From, but didn't he also use um, some, like, soil from, from home? Or am I, I no, I'm getting this wrong. This, You're completely this is my own. That. This is the Martian 2, my own screenplay. <laughs> yeah, sorry. No, no, it's, anyway. It's it's Martian soil and, and poop. Yeah, I believe that's what it is. That's absolutely right. I mean, the obvious follow up question is what did do well? If anything. Ah, so yes. things like radishes, for instance, grew quite well. Mm -hmm. So ah. there are plenty of alternatives and things that do seem to grow well, but it, it's early days. Okay. This research is still going on. So less mash, more salad. That yeah, kind that's of, okay. where it okay. seems yeah. to yeah. Can you imagine how bad your breath would smell on a radish-only diet? <laughs> There's good jobs only four of you there on the colonization well, if, machines. If my you goodness. Think that's bad. Um, it probably wouldn't just be an entirely vegetarian diet. In fact, it may actually make sense to have a small insect plantation that can actually eat parts well. of the biomass we can't ingest ourselves. And they could then provide the protein. Well, there you for go. Us. So well, Ryan, you've got to you... make little like bug bars. Yeah, so insect and radish. I wonder what your breath is That sounds like delicious. <laughs> and, but it segues, segues perfectly into our next question, which yeah. is from Rachel Leslie, who asks, would you take animals to Mars for food or would it be better to rely on plants? And then she talks about hydroponics and cloning plants and stuff. Mm. But yes, so 
Yeah, so you might take insects as opposed to animals then, yeah. is that what you're saying? Yeah, so insects would be a good first thing to actually bring. Mm -hmm. um, at least initially, it would be quite limited what we could actually raise on Mars. You can't take cows and chickens to Mars, there's mm -hmm. the space for that. Yeah. Um, you could eventually consider, maybe on mission, say, three or so, taking maybe frozen fish embryos and then um, dig out a pond, for instance, and then start to mature them. Uh, but it, it's oh, just cool. gradually improving the quality of life on Mars. It will take... There won't be pets on Mars for some time, but I'm sure eventually it'll become possible. Can you imagine being that that person who's been on Mars for, for however many decades when they go, we're bringing over one single fish. And you'd be like, <laughs> I already eat the fish. I already <laughs> He's eat the pet. That fish... So help me God, I will yeah. you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> this is how just the murdering rampages start yeah. on Mars. Nice. You killed Mr. my goldfish. Yeah. Mr. Finns is part of our crew. <laughs> do not touch him. Yes. Well, but that's the question, actually, because um, do you think, because obviously if you can get our protein from things like uh, insects that maybe you'd bring or, mm -hmm. or other kind of plant sources, do you reckon like animals would have a more important or a more useful role to play as a pet, something which gives that mm. kind of emotional support? Mm. Yeah, because particularly if you have a very small community on Mars, the, the psychological well-being of the crew will actually be very, very important. And so perhaps something like having a pet would actually help immensely with that. Mm -hmm. um, we It's difficult to know, actually. We obviously have had people living in Antarctica for long periods of We've time. Had one of them on this very show. We actually have had. Yes. yes. Did you ask if they have pets in Antarctica? <laughs> they went out. That was a good yeah, point. Yeah, yeah. No pets. Alcohol, yes. Pets, no. But there was the guy who reared the little slugs that he found on some of the leaves. <laughs> I remember That's the chef. I think. Yes. Yeah, so you have a better memory than I. Found a way. Yes. Uh, all right. So, Seb, do you want to take the next question? In, sure. I believe yes. it's uh, from. Kieran. We, we have a couple of uh, quick fire ones for you. Some slightly more oh, serious okay. than others. Sure make of them what you will uh, Kieran would like to know in the film Aliens <laughs> they had machinery which made the air of planet LV426 breathable with that in mind what happens if you find eggs eggs <laughs> ah um well I doubt we'll find um, very complex life on Mars particularly with the surface of Mars being strongly irradiated yeah. without a globomagnetic yeah, field course, yeah um, that's not to say that you couldn't dig down two meters and then find basic eggs. microbial life. Maybe, well, maybe fossilized eggs because yeah. Mars did used to be habitable about four billion years ago. Mm. So if there are ways to actually preserve those fossils, who knows? This maybe. Is, mm. this, but this I question don't think the eggs are a problem. <laughs> proved to be much better that because it, it starts with a very serious question and, and quite drastically tangents. Uh, but I'll, I'll follow it up very quickly with another uh, quick fire one. It, sure. Also on the subject of radiation. Will above ground bases, like the ones that we were making in Planet Base, uh, will they be protected from radiation? The, the short answer is no. Um, at least with current materials technology, if you want to protect a Martian base from radiation, you would have to partially bury it. Hmm. Ideally with between three and five meters of Martian soil to provide about the same level of protection the Earth's atmosphere gives us. That Wow. That's quite deep. That's quite That's deep, yeah. Further down than I thought. I was thinking sort of like two feet down. Just just a light dust but then, soil on top. <laughs> yeah, just, there we go. Just scatter it. Cam, why don't you take the next uh, quick fire one? All right. The, the final quick fire one yeah. for this moment we have um, is from Lloyd Dennison, who asks, I wondered at what frequency compared to Earth is Mars hit by asteroids? And will that affect mm. colonization? That's a really good question. So... Some of the latest work that we have from a couple of years ago, I believe 2013, mm. has estimated that the rate is slightly higher of these asteroid collisions than we previously thought. So the latest figures that I'm aware of is about 200 impacts per year, which is um, more than what Why? we receive on the moon, for instance. And that's purely just because Mars is a lot closer to the asteroid mm -hmm. belt and the mm. gravitational field of I Jupiter see. keeps flinging things out and uh, impacting it. Uh, so it, it's not close enough that Jupiter's gravity protects it and it sucks all the, all the near ones away. <laughs> it's kind of on that edge of things that orbit around Jupiter get lobbed Some down. kind of zone of yeah. danger, you yeah. could say. <laughs> yes. I'm not sure what you would call that. But. Uh, I mean, it's it's, it's a, a troublesome zone, Yeah, There's I other believe. factors as well, such as that Mars has a much thinner atmosphere, and mm -hmm. so rocks that would burn up before they hit the surface of the Earth will impact the surface of Mars. Uh, mm. Right, okay. But then equally, because <clears> Mars has much less mass, its gravitational field is lower. Mm -hmm. That means the impacts strike with a much lower velocity, for instance. Ah. So they don't do as much damage as they would on the Earth. But say if you're getting one roughly every two days or less, uh, one was to collide with a with your base, it, it would still absolutely atomize and decimate your colony. Not if it's only 10 centimeters or so across. Okay. It wouldn't do that much damage. And remember that we're talking 200 a year across an entire planet. 
And even on the Earth, <laughs> no one has ever been killed by an asteroid impact. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah. People yeah. have been a hit. Do- a dog was hit once in well, Egypt, I believe. Wasn't a man hit on the oh. foot in, like... Somewhere, I'm sure that was a thing. Unlucky person. I know, in yeah, but he was fine. But he, yeah, I, I, asteroid hit him. Maybe on the a foot. lucky. Yeah, is incredibly that, lucky. I'm not sure what, what you'd class that one as. But, but um, asteroids are quite precious. If one hits your foot, you should just pick it up and then sell it, and that'll pay for the surgery. Yeah, <laughs> and the burns on your hand from picking yeah. up the asteroid. <laughs> uh, all right. So the next question is from Matt Kamen, who says. Uh, how would long-term generational colonization of a lower gravity planet such as Mars affect human evolution? Ooh, ooh, That's interesting. Yes. So this is this is really fascinating. I mean, the short answer is we don't know because we haven't actually experimented with mm-hmm. this for a long period of time. But you can speculate slightly. So with the reduced gravitational field, you might expect that the spinal fluid will expand. Astronauts are actually slightly taller in space, for instance. All right. And that the body may adapt to this over many generations, such that we become slightly taller. There's other effects, such as the lower intensity of light on the surface of Mars, which is about 40% of the light we receive on the Earth, Mm -hmm. would probably lead to skin pigments becoming slightly lighter, for instance, as well. Um, Bones would become thinner, I would imagine, because they wouldn't have to be as strong to the reduced gravity. Mm -hmm. So I would say that overall, I would expect Martians to be weaker in terms of their bones and muscles. And and that's interesting because it means that if someone is born on the Earth, Mm. they can move to Mars and they'll be almost superhuman. For at least oh. for a, at least for a while, yeah. But someone born on Mars would really struggle to come to the Earth because they're. I mean, there's even a risk that just landing on the Earth, their bones may be so fragile that some of their bones could actually fracture during the landing on mm. the Earth. So, in that sense, it may almost mean that we have almost two species, even a few generations down the line. People born on Earth can live on two planets. People born on Mars can only live on Mars. But that's not really. Uh. If it's just a two or three generations, it's not really evolution, is it? Because it's 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 just um, people adapting, like people during their lives, ad- adapting to that environment. I suppose. Yeah, not not in the strict not really... biological sense. Obviously, yes. they, we'd still be the same species in terms of being able to to reproduce. I mean, like humans and Martians could still have uh, whatever a hybrid child yeah. would be. <laughs> um, so we wouldn't, from a biological standpoint, be different species. I, I guess what what we're alluding to is that if two of these these super pasty, lanky, weak. Um, <laughs> Martians <laughs> did successfully make it to Earth and had a child together. That that child would be an, a, a healthy Earthbound child. Yes, because because I guess the effects we're talking about are sort of things that happen after you're born. They're not evolved. Yeah, they'd, they'd be more yeah. of an effect of I mean, over, adaptation. Maybe over like with. hundreds and thousands of generations, right? Mm. Or actually, I don't know how many generations they have to be. But I after think a long we'll be period surprised of time, by how quick it will be. Really? So maybe, I maybe. I would think we'd start seeing some traits starting to gradually seep in maybe even as short as 10 generations or so. Wow. But so people again, with naturally we'd have to see. thin yeah. bones would be, uh, that the traits would be selected for it. But then, yeah, okay. Anyway, I, uh, that's we're, just, we're, we're, we're sidetracking. We ourselves. are sidetracking. Let's, let's move on to a far <laughs> more serious question from Michael Power, who says, are Mars bars just called bars up there? When we build the first <laughs> pub on Mars, it should definitely be called the oh, Mars bar. Oh, <laughs> oh, that's so good. Yes. Oh, that's fantastic. I like that. Or, or Although d- Mars but- might sue you, the company Mars. Can, can they sue? Can they sue? That's a question. That's if you name how, anything, but on how are they going to subpoena Mars you all the way to Mars? Can, like, yeah, can really you put this letter on the? Well, they'll find a way. <laughs> there are actually people who work in space law trying to decide issues like this that's because amazing. many, many contracts that you actually sign these days only give rights. Throughout Earth. all the territories of the yeah, Earth, yeah, yeah. and they don't say throughout the universe. I love that. So, what do you do? We'll I'm a lawyer. Say. What kind of law? Space law. Space law. <laughs> yeah, amazing. Yeah, universe lawyer. All right, let's. Uh, I was wondering if the opposite would be the same as well. If Mars bars are just called bars, do all other is all other confectionery preceded by Earth, Earth snack? Like, yeah. Oh, it's Earth an Earth Snickers. Yeah, <laughs> Earth Twix. Yeah, that's good. I'm sure that'll get lame very quickly. I'm oh, sure this would. Earth cereal. <laughs> yeah. Oh, the, oh, not this. Earth chocolate. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Next question. Next Zeb. one. All right. Shamim Gamage wants to know which human breeding pair would be the most useful for populating the new planet. Personally, I'd go for Kirsty and Phil from Location, 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 as they'd sniff out all the best spots fast, and they look like they'd have fabulous children. It's a it's a very interesting question actually about the long term viability of sending humans to Mars. Of course, if we want to be self sending, we will eventually have to consider having children. Mm. The, there are some problems in this approach, though, which would mean that the first few people you send should just be going there to establish the infrastructure and the base, and not mm-hmm. to have children. And that's because we don't actually know if children develop properly and reduce gravity. And if you only have mm. four, eight, twelve people on Mars. 
if there is a complication during trial, childbirth, you could potentially lose your chief engineer, your chief doctor, and you just can't afford that. So there would have to be periods of animal Ooh. testing and things going on to even establish if a pregnancy is viable. So do you think that would be like a, just a contraception kind of thing or a no sex ban? <laughs> like, I'm just wondering how that yes, would... Yes, because I'm sure on Mars there would be so many people there to enforce that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know. We only send responsible people to Mars. <laughs> okay, right. Okay, fair yeah, enough then. With, uh, with libidos under control. Right. <laughs> who, we have no evidence of the effects of libido. On <laughs> Mars on libido. libido. We don't yeah. know. We don't know. Who knows? Yeah. <laughs> but we will find out. Um, okay, next question comes from Rupert Goodwins, who asks, this is a very good question. Mm. How do we avoid contaminating the Martian environment with so much Earth-originated life-based detritus? And, uh, you know, would it become impossible to find any evidence for traces of any native Martian biome? Oh, this is an excellent question, Rupert, because, of course, one of the key questions we're trying to answer on Mars is, has there ever been life on there, or could there still be life today? Mm -hmm. And... In fact, if we did have a viable microbe on the surface of Mars, I've seen some calculations that would show that it would only take about 10 years for it to spread over the entire planet. So what I would say is that it's almost inevitable that Mars has already been contaminated, not due to just us sending missions there, but due to the sheer frequency of asteroid collisions with either the Earth or with Mars exchanging material between Panspermia, the planets. right? Panspermia, yes, exactly. Just but what? then the question to ask <laughs> is, did life start on Earth first, or did it start on Mars first? Or oh. somewhere else. It certainly could have. And so... If we go to Mars and then we find Martian life, we sequence its genetic code and effectively try and place it on the tree of life. Oh, that'd be mm -hmm. such a... F Can you imagine if that was your job? And you're like, here, exactly. figure out where it fits in the genome, scientist man. Don't mess it up. And what if we find out that Martian life is far more ancient than any life that we've found on the Earth before? Oh, Whoa, we're all Martians. Amazing. We could all be Martians, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I would say that we shouldn't... We should put in some effort to try and not contaminate Mars. Like, for example, eventually when someone dies on Mars, we should cremate their body to avoid just burying it and contaminating it with all the microbes in the body. Mm -hmm. But I think it. I think when we do find life on Mars, it will be strangely familiar to life that we've already seen on the Earth just due to one of these past contamination events. See, what I've done is I've mentally, I've reprogrammed myself to think that Martian uh, gravity is as variable, well, in my mind, it varies from Earth level to Moon level. And I was just thinking, well, why would you burn a body when you could just have a space burial and just <laughs> just <laughs> fire no. it off into space? The, the gravity is slightly stronger than I believe, moon. yes, I've made a, a, a calculator is it a, on. A roughly a third of Earth's gravity? 38%. 38%. So roughly a third. Good. I've, I'm oh, that's learning actually, that's doing this show. Less than I thought. I thought it was sort of like that two thirds. Oh, wow. Okay. I, I know nothing. How know high could you nothing. jump? Oh, that's an interesting question. This isn't written down. This is just me. Because so like, that... I'm not very good at jumping. And I, I aspire to be better at jumping. Well, that depends. Because I imagine if someone was born on Mars, it mm -hmm. would probably be about the same height, purely just due to their muscles. Just, being what, weaker, why, would the, why would your muscles grow? But if I went to Mars... If you went to Mars, whoa, 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 then, then you would impress all the local Martian ladies by jumping. Really <laughs> that, that, that is how I choose to impress yes. the opposite sex, by jumping. Yes, yes. That is so try on his Tinder you. profile. Try and Jumps jump high. over Valles Marineris. Yeah. You might have a little bit of difficulty getting given how but what, I mean, do you, th do you think you'd be able to jump like a meter or something like that? Or, or oh, yeah. Is this... Meter would certainly be doable. Wow, that's awesome. Give, given that already the world record for high jump is something like three. Uh, yeah, <laughs> okay, I, I, meant, I meant like <laughs> Yeah, but come on. Up, yeah. We're talking up. about this. <laughs> anyway. I know I, what you mean. <laughs> moving I mean, I swiftly well, on. Because the gravity is less strong, you could safely land from said height as well. So you oh, could yeah. jump off higher things. There'd be far less injuries yeah. from falling over. We'd all be acrobats, basically. Yes. All, All right, right, final question Last from question. Uh, Julie Flower, and uh, I like this question because it kind of it kind of implies that maybe we spent the last uh, two videos, you know, wasting our time. Because she says, colonizing Mars is a daft idea. That's that's not a question, Julie. But anyway, <laughs> colonizing Mars is a daft idea. Is there a better planet with maybe oxygen? She makes a good point. Yeah, yeah that is a good point. Mm -hmm. um, because, of course, we have been finding many thousands of planets in recent years, exoplanets orbiting other stars. Mm -hmm. Although we haven't found oxygen yet on any of these planets, because we've only been able to characterize the atmospheres of gas giants. Rocky planets are a little bit harder. We'll get there in a few years' time. Mm -hmm. So we don't know of any planets except for the Earth with a decent fraction of oxygen in their atmospheres. But I think it's a safe bet that we will find some in the next five years or so. Mm. The problem, though, is just how far away these extrasolar planets are. Even the closest one 
Proxima b is about 50,000 times further away than Mars is. And it takes us six months to oh, get to Mars. Yeah. <laughs> so there could be, but Mars is the best bet if we actually want to go somewhere and live there this century. Is, is that sort of like, if we just want a proof of concept, Mars? Yeah, is, we have to start somewhere. Yeah. Yeah, and it's our best bet because it's our only bet, really, or achievable bet. Is that right? Yeah, I mean, you can go to the moon if you want for a holiday, but <laughs> it's not really a place to go and live there and establish a new home. Awesome. There you go. All right, well, I feel like we've learned a great... I've actually genuinely learned a great deal from yes, this. Yes, um, as have I. And if you missed part one as well, uh, Ryan, myself, and Lewis all sat down and played Planet Base, and we came up with our own uh, colony that we set up on our sort of fake Mars um, and I learned that you didn't kill everyone. We didn't kill everyone. Well, I, I, I did secretly... We've got a very good safety record. I did secretly kill some people. Uh, it was an asteroid. I didn't do it. It was it was not an error on my part. Uh, my, my asteroid laser just This is missed. why I'm never going to Mars with you. <laughs> That's fair. a terrible idea. I can't argue with that. But if you've missed that episode, do make sure you go and check it out. And, of course, go and check out our other episodes that are live already. Fascinating, fascinating insights into Mars and space travel with a series of other scientists as well. Uh, Cam, thank you for asking all the good questions. No problemo. Thanks for sending your questions. I'm going to go practice my jumping. And Ryan, of course, thank you so much for coming in and fielding two videos worth of uh, uh, interesting, uh, varied, and in some cases, totally innate uh, questions by us laymen. Do you mean inane? Yes. (laughs) It's my pleasure. They were great questions. (sighs) <sighs> you see, this is why this we is need why the you don't allow me. This is why I wasn't on the first video. <laughs> yes, thank you very much for coming in. Uh, and don't forget to check back for more uh, from the series of Space Explorers. <laughs>